Welcome everyone. I am Betsy. Hi, I'm Jason. Today we are here to discuss how to assess our students after we are finished with a lesson. So we're going to give some strategies and implementation ideas for assessment and grading in, in this short video. Um, we know you're already doing this. Obviously, you're giving students grades. This video is merely a reminder to help us be more intentional and more structured. Um, those are two words we're going to center our discussion around regarding assessment after lessons. So Jason, do we grade our student work at the end of every lesson? No, no, no. I think I think we do too much grading in in many cases as teachers. Um, I think we all have this need to uh, fill the grade book with as many grades as possible. And I, I think if we can shift that, there are two things I think we should be doing uh, very frequently, and that's assessing where students are at. And again, Teachers do that all the time. When students give you that quizzical look as you're giving directions, your brain is going, oh, they're not understanding what I'm saying. I need to restate that or provide these directions in a different way. And so again, that's a form of assessment. Really, really good. We want to do more of that. And again, just be a little bit more intentional and a little bit more structured as we do that. Um, when it comes to, to grading, I think if we can shift to thinking about what evidence are we collecting? And by we, I mean both us as teachers and our students collecting over the course of a quarter or a semester, a trimester, whatever our, our marking period is, a unit even over the course of learning or practice uh, concept or practicing a skill. And so then as we think about that evidence, that evidence should capture hey, I know how to do this thing. And, and um, again, our grading, our approach to grading, a particular our approach to grading with averages has some real flaws to it. So we get to the end of the semester and we've been averaging stuff all semester and it says I'm a B minus. Well, I'm an A at the end of the semester. I learned it. Like you as a teacher did your job. I as a student did my job. At the beginning of the semester, I was terrible at it. And so now, of course, most teachers are not grading. They're, they're grading for students to know each step along the way, and they're teaching that step. But so I'm exaggerating a little bit when talking about the flaws of averages, but that exaggeration is there to help point out that that system that we all just assume is the way to grade. It is it is not the only way to grade, and it probably is not the best way. The other thing I would add is um, to this notion of us doing too much grading. I think it is one of the factors. There are many. I, I don't want to pin this all in grading, but that is um, causing us as teachers to sometimes have less job satisfaction than we otherwise can have. And so I think if we really can shift to this concept of being intentional and structured with our assessment and then using that assessment data to help students learn more, we're going to be grading less and having a bigger impact with our instruction and we're going to feel better about our jobs uh, overall. So um, I think there's a lot going on here. So what are some examples of these types of assessments? What what do they look like at the end of a lesson? Yeah, so I think when we do do them, and they are good to do periodically, and we, we should separate these out from like really important formative or summative assessments in, um, in a the course of a unit or even over the course of a of a class, a course throughout a semester. Um, I think that these these can be quick hits, so they can be anything from a one question online form, a Google form or a Microsoft form or a few questions where you uh, in asking the students to describe their understanding of something, but you might also give them a quick rating scale, asking them to describe how they feel they have learned it, because oftentimes students know when they don't know something. So in addition to us being able to look at their explanation, I can quickly click through the 32 kids in my class and read their text. Uh, I, I can do that in a planning period later that day and what, probably six, seven, eight minutes and kind of just be jotting down who's got it and who doesn't have it, who understands it and who doesn't. Um, but also I couldn't be noting, oh my goodness, 
these six students said, I don't think I get this. And lo and behold, they do not get it. And so that's um, a thing. I think you can use you can use little um, post-it notes, uh, sticky notes throughout a lesson where students can parking lot their questions as they have them. So that can actually be happening throughout the lesson. They could go stick them on the board or the wall. They'll probably fall off the wall um, if you have a piece of chart paper. And then as part of your summary of the lesson as a class, you could you could look at those. Maybe some students would actually one of the things you could do then is as they're walking out of the room, if they've answered that question during the rest of the period, they could pull it off. And so you're just left with your period three chart paper of these are the questions we still have. Um, now, you may not know who has those questions, so that one's not going to really help you with grouping or regrouping students. And I don't know, I think you'd have to have a really strong classroom community for me to have students put their names on it with the publicly posting their questions like I would. I would probably have them do those anonymously, though. Um, actually, I don't know how much students know each other's handwriting anymore with our use of Chromebooks and iPads today, but at one point we all would have known each other's handwriting. I'm old. Um, so you could also have a little one, two, three, two, one feedback, for example, like what are three things you learned today? Uh, what are two fun facts and what is one question I still have or one thing I'm still struggling with? And again, that can go, you can hand out little half sheets of paper where you've created a template. Um, so while a Google form or Microsoft form is great for an exit slip, uh, paper still has a place on these. And students just hand them to you as they're walking out of the room. And then you can, again, literally sort those actual papers and say, mm, what do I need to do tomorrow to adjust? Um, another good assessment tool, and I would modify this to fit your needs, is a, a SWOT analysis, which is, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. Um, the threats one that takes a lot of kind of explaining to students, even to high school students. But if you spend some time at the beginning of the year, I think where this tool could be pretty effective is for like a longer term group project to have the group do some group reflection and use whatever your classrooms or maybe even as a department, you would you would come up with, hey, here's this SWOT analysis tool. And then students are also learning um, a structure that they're likely to use in their career in the future across a wide variety of our career pathways. So either way, the bottom line here is be intentional and say, I'm going to collect something and then provide some structure. Again, a Google form, a piece of paper that has some structure. Even blank post-its can have a structure if you're like, here's what we're doing with them. Here's where we're putting them. Here's how we're using them. Now, do you have to do these things every single day? You do not. But what I would make sure happens with at least the last two or three minutes of class is there is some summary, which can be hard to do, particularly in many of our CTE classrooms where we've got to clean up our culinary stations or put our tools away in the auto shop, right? Like there's a lot of things going on and we don't want to lose too much class time, but to have some kind of summary um, either. And, and ideally, it's OK for it to be where I as the teacher, I'm saying, here's what we did today. Here's what we're going to do tomorrow. But even better, if students can be talking to each other in small groups and think pair share kind of style pairs to say, what did we do today? What did I learn today? Um, that's really important. So at these types of set of assessments, you uh, briefly talked about grading. We don't want to overgrade. How do I know as a teacher when to grade these types of assessments and when to not grade these types of assessments? Yeah, so I think when it comes to grades, first of all, the, the question is, are students ready to produce something even a formative assessment, if it's got a grade going into the grade book, that's a benchmark. That's a moment where we're where we're we're doing this thing. And so I would compare it to um, endurance athletes today. So they're training, right? They're training all the time. You're going to run your marathon or do your triathlon, but you periodically. Um, and it's not every two weeks. It depends on your training program. Sometimes you'll go a month. Other times you'll do one every two weeks, but you'll do some kind of test of your fitness level. And you'll, you're kind of marking that to see where are we at. And that test of a fitness level, uh, and there's a, there's a lot of different kinds of tests. It 
VO2 max, FTP, that doesn't matter. But that test of that fitness level, that is like the grade. And we we want to be at a certain level. And hopefully the training we've done has gotten us ready for that. Every day of training, we're not grading. Because there are going to be good days and bad days. Our body is going to react differently. It's the same thing with our our minds and bodies, especially again in CTE, where we're having to use in many classes um, all of our bodies to to be able to do the work that we're doing. So I think it's being, again, very intentional. Where do I expect them to really know this thing? And the intentionality extends to what do I expect them to know and at what performance level or be able to do, excuse me, and at what performance level? And that should be really clear to students ahead of time. They should know you know, buy here. And we should also have some flexibility to adjust that. It's not like up, it's Friday. It's time for us to change the tire for a grade. Maybe we needed two more days to do that. Maybe we're ready to do that on Thursday. Like that notion of, hey, I'm going to give a vocabulary quiz every Friday. Um, that's good because there's some structure there. That I like that, but, and it's very intentional, <laughs> very intentional. But I think, um, is that the the thing we should be measuring? Is it the best way to measure it? And so you want to almost develop kind of a story when you're designing your unit plan. So I think when we grade comes out of our unit planning work and we've got our unit plan template, but to think about where do I need to know if they've got this before I can go on and have I prepared them well enough essentially for them all to get an A. So make no mistake, I'm not saying we should give every kid an A, but I think our goal as teachers should be that we've taught them all so well and they've learned this all so well through the activities we've done that their performance level is that A or B, they are meeting and exceeding whatever our standard was for that skill or that knowledge. And so again, you pick those out when you're designing the unit and you leave yourself enough flexibility to make some adjustments. Now, teachers are mostly doing this already. I'm not telling anybody that's like earth shattering here. So, um, but I think that that grading, it's one piece of your assessment puzzle and it is not the piece of the assessment puzzle when it is we suffer for it as teachers and more importantly i think our students suffer for it um so that would be my advice is to be thoughtful and probably to to limit those um and yet on the flip side um you know you'll hear administrators say well if you're only giving four grades what if they do badly on one of them? Well, that's where I would say there's other mechanisms. Like, how are we allowing students to redo stuff? Like, OK, so they didn't know it or they couldn't do it when you did it. Then we kept teaching them and they relearned it. And now that their performance level is an A. I, I don't understand why we're penalizing them because they got the A in October versus the A in September. Uh, they can do it at this level. And so I think that's something we need to, to think about. Now, don't get me wrong. On that last point, that does create a lot of complications for us as teachers. And that's probably a whole nother set of videos of how do we manage redos, for example, retakes and redos uh, as teachers in ways that, that don't make us go crazy. Um, but for another time, in the meantime, yeah. be intentional, be thoughtful. You probably need less graded assessments than you think. Jason, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you provided a lot of great information that we can take back to our CTE classrooms. Just a reminder for our listeners, uh, we do have additional resources linked to our unit and lesson plan templates. Thank you and have a great day.